Uh, welcome to the first Beef and Lamb New Zealand North Canterbury Farming for Profit event for 2021. Really cool to have a few of you along. Uh, I'm your new facilitator for the program, Sarah O'Connell, and I'm now working at the Agribusiness Group based in Lincoln, where my main role is facilitation. So tonight's webinar, it's all on working dogs, um, and we have got with us Laurie Linning, who is a vet through Vet Life in Alexandra, uh, and she has been involved heavily in the teammate program um, right from its, its get-go almost, um, which was way back in 2003. Uh, the uh, teammate program is a combination and a, a team a teamwork project really through Massey University and um, the, the Working Dog Centre at Massey University and VetLife. But um, Laurie will go into that in a little bit more detail. She's been the lead veterinarian for the program uh, since the very beginning of it. So she's got plenty of information to share with us um, on the topics that um, we've worked on this evening. So we're going to look into general health, um, such as housing and vaccinating and worming, uh, feeding dogs, uh, so looking at what's the best type of feed to feed your dog, is the dog that you've got, does it need specific feed for the kind of work that it's doing, and so on. And then what are some of the ins and outs around buying a dog? Uh, so Laura's going to share her knowledge, wisdom and insights uh, around all of that information for the evening. So um, I've just seen a few additional people have um, jumped onto the call since we first started. So welcome everybody. Um, just a quick reminder, keep your lines muted. If you have questions, pop them into the chat box function um, and we'll get those answered uh, as we go through. So time to crack into a wee bit of content now, so I'm going to hand over to Laurie. And um, Laurie, you can introduce yourself, uh, introduce the teammate project a wee bit, um, and then we'll get into our content topics, um, or starting with uh, general dog health. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Laurie Linney, and I'm a veterinarian in um, Alexandra. i have originally from Canada. I've been in New Zealand for over th over 30 years um, and one of my biggest passions uh, certainly is working dogs. I was a large animal vet for quite a few years before I ended up being, um, I became a really really interested in orthopedic surgery so with that comes lameness and all sorts of activities that involve our working dogs. So um, from that we decided to look at um, setting up a program that would give us a little bit more information of the general health and um, what exactly was going on with our working dogs. Because if you look at the information that we have available to us on the general um, husbandry and management of New Zealand working dogs, it amounts to about one small box in a warehouse. So we decided to set up a basically a five to six year program that was um, looking at just about everything we could with working dogs, right? From feeding, vaccination, worming, um, what they were fed, how they were housed, um, what kind of animals they worked with, how many, how many stock interactions they would have. Um, so basically we did full on recording for um, six rounds. So those animals were hands-on examined by a veterinarian um, six times over the course of those years. Um, about four years from 2014 to 2018 and we ran um, an embedded parasite study as well as we used hay rex monitors for about 18 months and recorded some information there now there's been a lot of information come out of it there's still an awful lot more to come um, so it's pretty exciting it doesn't seem like it's um, earth-shattering for some of the for some people but um, it's going to be referred to as a baseline project for for many years to come so um without further ado we might head into the first topic which is basic general health um so the working dog project was um 126 owners involving about 640 dogs we sort of had in our heads we were going to look at about 
300, but it soon um, morphed into something a bit larger. So um, it was pretty interesting. So um, um, part of our big things with Gemma Health is um, vaccination. So the core vaccinations that we would look at are the vaccinations that we have available to us for um, dogs. The core vaccine, which is parvovirus, distemper, adenovirus, or adenovirus 2, which is hepatitis, and there is one also that um, is involved in one of the viral types of kennel cough, and, and pair of influenza, which is also a respiratory virus. Uh, kennel cough vaccinations, which usually are either intranasal or uh, subcutaneous injection, are mostly um, for the bacterial component of kennel cough, and that's Bordetella bronchoseptica. We're currently um, in most of our regions are undergoing or experiencing an outbreak of kennel cough right from Christchurch South. Um, with, there is, I'm sure there's a world further north than that. We don't, we don't pay that much attention to it. But uh, certainly in the southern part of the South Island, we're certainly experiencing lots and lots of kennel cough, both in pet and um, working dogs. Um, the last one on that list is leptospirosis. We don't tend to worry about it too much in the South Island because it um, doesn't tend to be much of a clinical issue. That does become an issue if your animals go to the North Island um, and we require vaccination for that. So general recommendations. Well, best practice recommendations would be that you vaccinate for with the core vaccine and your big, big one is parvovirus. I'm sure that everybody knows about parvovirus that causes hemorrhagic diarrhea in puppies and can have quite a high um, mortality rate. Um, very infectious and lasts a long time in the environment. Now, that, those core vaccines, they should be started at between six to eight weeks and be vaccinated every four weeks until they're over 12 to 16 weeks, um, depending on what um, type of which vaccine you're using and what the recommendations are. The current World Small Animal Veterinary Association recommends that your last vaccine be after 16 weeks of age to get over any residual maternal immunity that some um, puppies might have. That means that that immunity that they get from the colostrum will interfere with their ability to mount an immune response and they do recommend um, that their last puppy vaccination be after 16 weeks. So after they have their set of puppy vaccinations, they are usually vaccinated again at six to 12 months and then as an adult every three years. As far as kennel cough goes, that's um, generally you can start whenever you like. It only takes three days for intranasal and um, 14 days after two injections to mount an immune response, but those need to be boosted annually as does leptospirosis. So those are the best practice recommendation. In the rural world, well, that doesn't tend to happen that much. Uh, through our study, we found 45% um, of dogs were vaccinated only as puppies. So they had their course of puppy vaccinations and they never vaccinated, never vaccinated again after that. And another 12% <laughs> were never vaccinated. And then the remaining 40-odd um, percent were um, had some or variable types <laughs> of vaccinations and um, different vaccination intervals. But working dogs are a little bit of a different situation compared to pet dogs in that they're usually living in fairly, um, you know, um, areas that are far away from big um, populations of dogs. So they don't tend to come in contact with a huge number of dogs, except in a certain situation, say as a shepherd who may move from property to property. And those dogs in particular are more likely to spread disease than the ones that live on the same farm for their entire lives. Um, I think where we probably have to be very careful is those puppy vaccinations. The parvo vaccination um, is the one that probably causes the greatest incidence of disease in our working dogs. And certainly uh, that's a very good vaccine. It has um, a really good protection against the disease. And so usually if they have one to two vaccinations with parvovirus vaccination, they, if they do come down with the disease, it's usually a mild form um, and certainly is often protective for a very long period of time. 
um, how long exactly those vaccinations are protective for. Well, the drug companies, you, as adults, give you every three years, and they don't have, um, haven't gone beyond that to get the data um, to prove how long those vaccinations last, uh, simply because it's a money-related issue. Now, the other thing I guess you can do, or that is being done overseas, is that people are doing um, titers, antibody titers, to see if their dogs need to be vaccinated. In New Zealand, that's cost um, really cost prohibitive. It's just cheaper to vaccinate them, I suppose. Um, but certainly, there are people who don't want to vaccinate any more than they absolutely have to, and that um, that can be offered. But so for your general working dog. Don't please don't miss the, um, those core vaccines as puppies. Um, it's a way way easier thing to do to prevent the uh, parvovirus than it is to treat it. Certainly, a hang of a lot less expensive. Um, certainly, distemper and hepatitis we don't see too much of anymore. There is a little bit tinkering around, but uh, the amount of it that's that's in the population isn't really that significant. Um, back from that, we go to worming of, of pups and adults. Now, this probably seems pretty pedestrian to a lot of people, but it's amazing the variation in um, husbandry that we found um, well, with worming um, through a lot of people. You know, we would ask people generally, you know, do you worm your dogs? Yes, we worm our dogs. And it was every combination of how often and when. Um, and certainly the sheep measles um, treatments were something that really amazed me. You know, sheep measles has been around for years and years and years, and you think that everybody sort of would know how to sort that one out, but but indeed, um, a lot of people just weren't aware of, of how often and when you should be treating for that. So starting out with pups, pups should be wormed starting at two weeks of age. Um, you know, it's heartbreaking to, to have a puppy brought in for a post-mortem and have it full of um, full of worms that have a gut rupture or an obstruction simply due to the fact that it's got massive uh, ascarid loads or um, blood out due to hookworm infection. So again, something that's that's pretty easy to prevent. Um, certainly in the, the the parasite trials that we did run, we we did found that the um, that the couple of wormers that are commonly used in dogs um, don't tend to look like they're causing um, resistance, still effective and um, you know not an issue to continue on with what we have. So those pups start at two weeks of age and then um, continue on every two weeks until they're 12 weeks of age. As they get a little bit older they do develop some immunity and certainly have much less reinfection rate. Um, as at after 12 weeks, we go every once a month until they're six months of age. And then as, a, as an adult, we'll talk about them down, that down below. Um, certainly use a broad spectrum wormer. Make sure you're using something that treats the biggest thing in puppies is roundworms, ascarids. Um, as they get older, tapeworms are, are more important, but um, certainly use a broad spectrum wormer in those puppies. Um, as far as your adults goes, there are two trains of thoughts there. Um, some people treat for sheep measles and some people don't. Um, if your dog never has opportunity to um, come in contact with either untreated offal or meat, then there probably isn't a huge infection rate. And those people believe that um, because of those, the way they manage their feed that they don't need that. Uh, we st I still come across dogs that have tapeworms. Um, every now and then, so I think still an important issue. So as an adult, if you're not going to worry about sheep measles, then for their own health, they should be warmed uh, once every three months with a broad spectrum warmer. That's to get both roundworms and tapeworms. Most people uh, still use, still treat for sheep measles, and sheep measles needs to be treated every 30 days. That's the, the length of time it takes for reinfection. So um, basically you're looking to treat once a month with a tapewormer and every third month with a broad spectrum wormer to get you back into those um, roundworm treatment for the animal's health. So 
So again, if you look down below there, it says month one, use a broad spectrum wormer. And then the two months in between, you just need to use a tapewormer. Their tapeworm medication by itself is much less expensive um, and certainly an easier way to go financially than treating with broad spectrum wormers all the time. Um, part three of general health, I guess we're going to talk about housing. And that was, that was an interesting thing that we, that we got to look at lots and lots of kennels. Um, there was a lot, a, you know, a big variation of materials and types of kennels. Um, some people are, are getting pretty swish as far as what they're getting into with heated insulated kennels in some aspects. In central Otago, we can get awfully cold in the wintertime down into the, to the, um, you know, low, 15s and 20s, and it's um, it's dang cold for those guys out there with without much protection. So basically, your housing will affect the energy requirement and quality and quantity of sleep that your dogs are getting in the, at night. Um, and so that affects how much you need to feed them, and also affects how much recovery your dog's going to get overnight. Um, and how tired they're going to be the next day. And I guess I always, I don't think it's a big jump to believe that, um, you know, a dog like a person, if you get a poor night's sleep, then you're going to be more likely to be not paying attention at work and cause yourself injury during the day. Um, so I guess the things that we maybe need to think about are um, shelter and position of kennels. So putting them in a place where they can get some sunshine on them in the day to heat them up. Um, and out of the wind, if at all possible, and certainly in some places um, in central Otago, it's pretty tough because the wind comes from several different directions. Certainly in Canterbury, we know that to be a fact. But uh, there are ways and means of providing them wind protection, especially in the winter time when the winds are really, really cold. Being some people would uh, put carpet that they wrapped around the outside of the kennels, so it broke the wind, and that made a huge difference to the, the warmth of the kennels themselves. Um, removable doors or flaps so the dogs could go in and they had a chance to let their own body heat, heat kennels up, especially if they were uh, insulated. It doesn't take an awful lot to get them comfortable. Um, bedding. There was um, about 44% of the people that we, we canvassed used some uh, type of bedding and that varied from um, straw to sacks stuff with wool or straw, um, actual um, burlap beds that, that are pretty popular nowadays to, to proper bedding, carpet in the bottom. Um, and you will always come across dogs that their very favorite thing to do is to, as soon as you put that bedding in, they like to tear it all out. And those dogs become, can become a bit of a problem. I did come across one fellow locally and he just kept trying different options until he found something that they that they would leave. And most dogs, um, he said he, he could get them to figure out that actually they were better off with bedding them without. Uh, but he did have one dog in particular that there was no way that he could keep bedding in his kennel. And sometimes, you know, he might leave it for a week and then have a tanty and then throw his toys out of the cot and have no bedding in his kennel yet again. Um, insulation is starting to be more common. There's about 14% of people that look at insulating their kennels, be it uh, using bats or uh, styrofoam, especially under the floor. That's where we tend to get a lot of um, grease coming through. Um, you may have uh, nice tin walls, but those floors are always slatted and they tend to let an awful lot of cold air up and in through the, where the dogs actually sit in. Um, and then we look at um, coats, and there was 24% of our people that use coats, and probably quite a few more people use coats by the time we were finished than, than when we started. Um, they were only just beginning to sort of be coming in vogue around about, you know, early to 2010, uh, and certainly they're becoming more and more popular. Again, you do come across some animals that, especially puppies, that are quite happy to take their coats off. But um, the more common story we hear is that uh, the dogs line up to have their coats on at, at night when they hold them open, they run in and they, you know, they run straight into the, they yoke them to be strapped in for the night. 
So there's a lot of people that are using, a lot more people now using coats than they did before. Yeah, we have had one question come in and I came up with the question myself. Um, so does Drontal cover sheep measles? Yes, it does. So Drontal's um, got protection against both roundworms and tapeworms. So Drontal will do, that's your one that's the broad spectrum wormer. The one that you would marry up with that in the months in between would be Dronset, which is just tapewormer by itself. Or there's uh, variable ones available out there now um, called, you know, your veterinarians will help you guide through those. They've all stocked different ones. We tend to, I think there's, there used to be an Ancare tapewormer. There's another, it's just called tapewormer. But that, that tends to, to cover what you want. So drawn tall is a broad spectrum. Drawn sit is tapewormer only. Cool. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, so the question that I had was also in relation to, to worms, and it was worms and puppies. And my query was kind of around where do those puppies get those worms from? So no. brown worms are pretty clever. Um, if, you want to, if you want to reinfect a puppy, then the most sensible thing to do would be have your uh, larva sitting on the teats, and that's exactly what happens. So the eggs pass in the mother's uh, feces and those larvae um, sit around the teats, the puppies latch on and that's how they become infected. So they can have direct fecal contamination, but generally that's, that's where their, um, their infection comes from. In, and so certainly that are worming your mother's very, very important that bef you know, in the, just the weeks up to, leading up to when your bitch is gonna have puppies that you should be worming her to help decrease that worm burden that she might have. Uh, another question that has come in, um, what do you recommend to use for pups? Yeah, so um, round rooms are your, are your big concern. So it's, you just make sure that you've got a product that's, that's going to cover that. Um, there used to be some lovely um, suspensions that we don't have available to us anymore. Um, you can make suspensions or get them made for you by, by crushing tablets up and um, injecting them, you know, just instringing them into their mouths. Um, you just got to be careful the doses that you're using based on the kilogram of puppy that you're, you're treating. Because getting a, getting a worm tablet down a puppy of two weeks of age ain't that easy. <laughs> cool. So how do you know you've got the right dose? Uh, that'll be, that's basically, um, most worm tablets are, are based on a, on a per kilo basis. So you weigh your puppies and dose to your heaviest puppy. Uh, and you know, mo if you're having tr trouble figuring out your amounts, if, if you're thinking of making a suspension, make sure you talk to your vet will sort it out for you. It's not a problem. Like we make up, um, you know, we'll crush a 10 kilogram tablet and, and suspend it in 10 mils of water. So it's one mil per 10 uh, per um, kg. So if you've got a puppy that weighs 500 grams and you give them half a mil. So there's, there's those ways, but please, if you're not really happy with your math, get someone to help you out with that. Thank you, Laurie. Really awesome. Um, you did a fantastic job <laughs> and uh, awesome amount of knowledge that you've got. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much.